Today on the podcast, as we broadcast live from Esto 22, Rachel and Michael from Nativo jump on to talk about the importance of storytelling. And our guest today on the podcast from Nativo, Rachel, Michael, how are you guys today? We're doing super great, thank you. Well, we're still waking up, so yes. not super great yet. <laughs> the, the drive started at six, so we're yeah. doing good. The goal is super great. Rachel, obviously, we are familiar with what Nativo does. But for those who don't know what Nativo does or is for, can you kind of give me a 10,000 foot view of what Nativo is? Yeah, absolutely. So what Nativo does in a nutshell is we basically provide the ability or the technology to connect advertiser storytelling with consumers in a way that doesn't really interrupt their experience. We do that by partnering with publications like MLive. Mm. Um, in order to really bring people content experiences that look and feel like content. So if you want to see an article, you get to see that article without clicking out to a place that you didn't want to, or you know, seeing a video that you didn't want to see. We really try to create an experience that's integrated and seamless so that people can discover brands. Now, you did a podcast towards the end of what we'll call uh, the dystopian novel that is COVID. Um, <laughs> and one of the pieces of data that I was blown away by, which is why you guys are, are important in this space, is that 6% of travelers start their search at a DMO, right? And yes. we're at a conference filled with people that want them to come to their DMOs. Yes. So talk a little bit about why it's important to show up natively and, and how Nativo can help in that space. And either one of you can kind of take that jump ball. So when it comes to like tourism specifically, right? All of us as consumers, we think about how many different things we check before we book anything, right? We read the reviews, we see social media, we read the blogs, all of these different touch points. Very, very rarely are we going to a DMO site to also corroborate our decision, right? That's just not something that we do because it feels really branded. Not to say that destinations shouldn't have content, they shouldn't they should absolutely have their own voice. But if we're not necessarily going to those places, there is a need to augment that storytelling and put it in the places that make sense for that person so that they can arrive at the, that decision on their own, right? So it's less about should you or should you not, it's more about you absolutely should, but let's help you get more eyes on that storytelling. All of the destinations here have so many good stories to tell. If people aren't seeing them organically, we try to help with that. Yeah, I think that the thing I'd add to that is we were built pretty much exclusively on context and engagement. So as you can imagine, the experience of someone researching their next trip or trying to figure out where they want to go, it's a very exciting one. There's a ton of data points on what that person looks like. So seeing the person who travels to your DMO or who books this trip, we can really look at those data points of what they consumed and what they engaged with to find other people that looks like that. It's in our basically in our DNA what we started as and really focusing on that. And because we work with so many sites like yourself, we get to look at that across so many different ad calls and figure out what that looks like. And with data being as messy as it is, that's really the way to do it. What someone engages with, what someone cares about, match that out. Well, and it's funny that you say that, Michael, because I was just talking last night with a buddy of mine about the, the nightmare scenario of the Apple silo, Google right. silo, Facebook silo, where this becomes paramount, right? Yep. Big time. And I, I think we'll, we've seen where, listen, the, the announcement of cookies going away, that might be something we hear a new update on every six months. <laughs> Uh, we probably Turns won't. out we love cookies, yeah. right? Well, and the crazy part is in the beginning, everyone's like, okay, we're not going to worry about it. When it happens, it happens. And then now that it's delayed, people are like, oh, no, we started thinking about it. And no one for a long time even mentioned Apple devices. You, you'd work with a partner and they'd say, eh, we really like this data set. We're like, ah, oh, do you see your consumer using an iPhone or an Android? They're like, Maybe an iPhone, but maybe both, you know, who knows? It's like, then don't you care to kind of break away from that? So I think the, the cool part about travel is it's a little more unique in that way that the signals are great and people are starting to care about that more and more. So it really builds into what Rachel said. Awesome. All right. So we talked about destination marketers, but what are they doing right and what do they really need to do more of? From a storytelling standpoint, I think with destinations, there is such a need to be telling great stories, right? We all, we all know that. And it's one of the unique things that unifies and binds people to that place, right? But oftentimes storytelling gets kind of, you know, flung to the background when we think about where our budgets need to go. You know, these are, these are lean teams oftentimes that are dealing with shoestring budgets. They have tons of stakeholders. They're working with local governments. 
And so oftentimes you, you might see yourself sacrificing those good stories because you can't actually measure them properly, right? S sexy storytelling is great, but if you can't actually show how many people arrived in your destination, stakeholders are not gonna be happy. So from, from my own perspective, the storytelling is key. What, we, like, what we've tried to do is find a way to get people to measure it better so that it makes it a better case to sell through. Um, but really it just comes down to finding those unique stories and doing things differently. Every destination has an itinerary that ticks all of the boxes, right? Every single stakeholder is mentioned, great. It, itineraries are important, but there are so many other unique angles to take that finds people to a place. Like what are the local businesses doing? You know, what are the makers and the movers and shakers of, of a place doing that are unique? You know, those are the stories that we don't often highlight because they're hard to measure. And so when it comes to leaning into that, I think that's, if we can find a way to actually measure that and make it make sense, those are the stories that make people think of a place even if they're not actively in that decision mindset to book yet, right? Those are the stories that you remember, you know? And then you can look back and say, hey, I remember this story. I think I wanna really go there. Like that's on my mind now because I have an emotional call to it that isn't just, you know, ticking the boxes of an itinerary. It's those stories that I'd love to see more of, but we understand kind of why they're harder to do. Oh, 100%. Okay, tell me some of the stories that stick out in your brain. Do you have anything that just come to mind? From our perspective, like the, the destinations that we've worked with, there's a couple. I mean, I, I work with a lot of our destinations, um, our colleagues do as well. We've seen really great stories in, in the past year, um, like Asheville um, has actually done a story recently where they took people on a tour, like a walking tour digitally, of all of the different buildings in Asheville that were built by a black brick mason from the 19th century. Oh, wow. Who had his name on all, of the, you know, he built these, these places by hand and made a name for himself in a time where, like, really, we weren't seeing a lot of that, right? And so the, the article kind of walks you through that step by step. Here's the walking tour you can take. So it had a tangible sort of call to action, come back to this article and follow these step by step. It also showed that Asheville cares about you know, inviting a, a more diverse audience in. So that to me was, you know, it was cool in the sense that it was really inviting without like in your face being like, hey, like, you know, this is what we do. That's one that was really unique to me. We've also seen Visit Utah, who we've worked with for years. They tell a lot of great stories about how to travel like a local or disperse your footprint because Utah has the unique experience that too many people go to their national parks, <laughs> right? Good for them. Yes. But now the responsibility falls on them to, to, to dial that back a little bit and say, okay, you're coming to the national parks, we get it, but here's how to maybe do it in a more smart, more responsible, more sustainable way so that we're not overwhelmed and so that people can continue coming for decades and decades to come. And that's a unique kind of challenge of destinations, right? Is yes, we want tourism, what happens when you get a lot of it, you know? Then you have to tell a different story. And that's kind of the power of it, right? So we've seen a lot of great stories come from them on, okay, we've been too successful, now what do we do next, you know? Yeah, I think what, one thing that's really cool that she brought up related to that is we've actually seen brands come to us recently and ask us about our tourism group's content and almost ask if, hey, can we partner? Like we we always have sat in between publishers and brands, but now I'm starting to see we might sit between brands and brands. Like, hey, we saw that you guys did this with this tourism. Do you think they'd want to partner? And it's that's cool thing where you see with these local tourism groups where people are starting to say, ooh, is that a content creator for us? Like, it, can I sponsor their content instead of me sponsoring our own? Uh, it's a unique pathway that I, I see starting to exist. You, you hear about brands becoming their own publisher, their own advertising company. Cities and, and different areas might do the same thing. So what do you think it is about, let's say, if you are in the Venn diagram of brand to brand at this point, you know, what is it about brands that just are saturated with stories but don't know how to wrangle them right as if they're a bunch of wild horses running around and and they need a product and a team like nativo to help mm -hmm. them do that you know what are some of the ways that they can start thinking about either a 
finding a DMO that looks like and feels like them and then coming to Michael or Rachel and saying, hey, could you put us together? Or B, where do they even start to think about where the horses are yeah. and then how to tame them? Yeah, I think it's tricky because it's a very new world and like we've seen brand partnerships that collaborate on goods and stuff like that. It felt very normal. Like I remember even when uh, but there was like the Eddie Bauer Explorer back in the day, random stuff yep, like that. Yeah, but yeah. This is a whole different breed. And I think one thing that's very unique is content is very old. It's been around forever. It's no new advertising type, but it's had this real personal connection that's ever evolving. It's not over technology, right? Like a lot of other things, but it used to be very linear. It's like, we're going to do this in the spring and this in the summer and this in the fall. But then when you work with people like Rachel that work specialized in travel and then you tie it to a platform like ours, it's a lot more responsive. You know, as you mentioned it before, like finding those signals, what's going on with businesses. It's an always on thing. It's starting to feel more like social media where you have to be constantly tweaking it and evolving it and looking for those signals. Yeah, um, I think, I think to, to that point, when it comes to like, yes, everyone has content. You can make a you can make a decision. People can sit in a conference room, kind of like this, and make a decision. This is the article that is going to appeal to the travel and tender, right? But when you pair it with technology, you're you're able to see these stories are really resonating with foodies or families or you know people that um, are hitting the road and taking you know their work on the road with them. Like now, you can kind of see and peel back the nuances of how the different stories appeal to different people. And when you look at it in a broader way, you know, travel is not a monolith. The travel and tender is such a big blanket phrase. Yes. It's everybody, right? And there's so many layers to that. Yep. So that's, I think, the need for having a, that kind of approach to storytelling. Everyone has content, but to o really understand the power of it, you need to start looking at, at the different nuances of who can appeal to it and what, yeah. you know, how that really is shaped. Big time. And if you look at a single piece of content that we run, you still have to get someone to the content. So before even someone gets there, we're analyzing over 36 to 50 different variations of just images and headlines. And all that turns into data. And then when someone gets to it, our platform's able to tell people, hey, you were talking to this person, but we actually saw these other data sets that cross over with it. So you might have been saying, I'm looking for a head of a household who's planning a family vacation, but we're also finding you know, a younger audience who's starting to explore this place. Maybe you should focus on that. And here's the type of engagement this person focused on versus that. So you might pick one audience, but we're seeing all the different audiences that actually engage with it. So Michael, to, to Rachel's point, as somebody comes into your ecosystem, how often are they wildly off at that assumption, right? Because I, I would imagine if I'm coming to you the very first time, I have a lot of assumptions about yeah. a traveler mm -hmm. because right. I have no data to back it up. And then you get in and show that, no, they don't drive a Subaru, they drive an Eddie yeah. Bauer Explorer, yeah. right? <laughs> right, like, right? How you know how often are they coming to you and you're going, yeah, you're nope, that's not the, that's not the human, right? Or, and or you're missing all of these humans. I think that's more it, right? It, it's you probably know who's coming and you probably know your stereotypical person that's coming, but why are you caring about them? They're going to come anyway, right? There's probably all these other subsets uh, that you can pay attention to. And if you're too focused in on one thing, you're going to build out too much of that. And I think you see cities always try to evolve a little bit of, this is where we're also adding, or we're trying to move this in. And you have to look at those other subsets to make sure you're appealing to them. If there is any silver lining, if you will, of the past two years of this uh, pandemic chapter that we've all been, you know, enduring. It's that we've started to see that tourism marketers, DMOs, state tourism organizations, are taking a step back and really reevaluating what their audience is. The audience that they thought they knew two, three years ago is no longer the audience that they might have today. More people are working from home than ever before. You know, people have had two years to really reckon with what's important to them. People are doing more road trips. Gas prices, you know. Uh, uh, Nonwithstanding, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I think I think too like that's been a unique opportunity to really say, hey, you knew who your audience was. Your audience can, is going to look different now. It's always going to change, um, and the content you already have is a way to understand that better. You know, and we've had more and more of those discussions. Uh, more and more brands are really open to saying, hey, we don't know everything about our audience anymore. 
Can you help us refigure that out? This is more of uh, this will probably make you shudder because it's not a, <laughs> okay. it's not empirical. It's you know it's not analytical. It'd be more empirical. But I'm wondering because we've had a couple people through doing podcasts, and and one of the things that they ask when we're done, so I won't name names, is like they're they're pondering at this point if this trend line of travel to their destination is real or Memorex, right? Because people are coming out of the pandemic, they've got money to spend, so they're going to a lot more places. Are, are you guys seeing data to show maybe what the future might hold for these guys? And I imagine if you did, they might want to talk to you in the next couple of days, but <laughs> because that's a question on their mind. But because of the data that you have, I'm wondering, future casting, what do you think travel looks like three years from now, if you guys can even kind of put a, a, a pulse on that? My gut tells me, and this is also not empirical, so let's start there. Um, <laughs> that I think I think what the past two years has done was remind everyone of the importance not only of travel uh, but also of about like enriching your life outside of your work and your household and really having those experiences that are memorable. Agnostic of the destination, I think that's always going to be important, right? And so. What I hope you know happens in the next three years with travel is that these tourism entities really start to say, "Hey, we need to make sure that we have you know the the product and the infrastructure and the the interesting angles and the and the strong stories mm -hmm. to continue to attract those people that are no longer thinking about travel in a silo." I'm you know I'm hopeful it's no longer going to be I need one you know five day vacation at an all inclusive resort and then I'm done I don't need travel again until another year. I hope that if anything the last two years have made people more curious, you know, and open. And so destinations need to adapt and evolve and be more complex in a way in terms of what they offer and who they offer it to. And I think that'll sustain kind of this yeah. this consistent you know, return to destinations time and time again. It's all about evolving, right? Evolving and making sure you're doing so in a responsible and scalable way. That's how I think destinations will continue with three, five years from now uh, to, to keep people coming. Yeah, I think data is valuable, but it, as soon as you make travel too analytical and you overanalyze it, you're probably doing it wrong. Like it's such a romanticized, you know, fun thing that if you're looking at the data too much, you might screw it up and you and you really got to be looking at three years because a lot of people are planning for three years out or two years out or they see something and they're thinking that in the back of their head and they put it on their list. I know Rachel and I both probably have checklists. We both love to travel. Like here's all the places we want to go. When is it going to hit? You have to keep that conversation going throughout that. And I think what happened a lot, even all of advertising is everything became so analytical and so price oriented. And then what we ended up having is a bunch of really bad ad experiences that had really interesting numbers behind them. It's like, ooh, this was really cost efficient, but it was a terrible ad. So the cool part about what both those brands are doing and what we're working on is let's keep the human element, let's make it fun, let's make it an emotional tie and like create a real connection with the consumer, but then let's look at what's going on with it. Let's not make it retroactive and look back, like let's get data in the moment, talk about what they're engaging with and make sure you lean into that stuff. Yeah, I have a friend who often says that modern marketing doesn't get nearly close enough to the consumer, right? right. And so for you, we're at Esto, it's an education conference, you guys have something that people want to talk about. Yeah. So because you are data minded i think one of the things that people make an assumption about you yeah. if we were going to you know make a, a you know a demographic about michael is that you know well data people aren't creative right yeah. but at the end of it and this is what i want to talk about you obviously are highly curious and probably your superpower i've met you 8 minutes ago so i don't know but like <laughs> you know you're giving one, me way too much credit you know already. one of one of your superpowers is probably the ability to take that data and turn it into a story right and so when when you meet people here at esto like what what is the pitch like? What questions are they asking you? And what are you hoping to get out of the next couple of days? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, we're called a storytelling platform for a couple of reasons. One is because we let brands tell their story. The other part is exactly what you're saying. We have to tell a story about what they're doing. Um, I think what I want to get out of it is when people ask questions to try to figure out what's going on with their current campaigns or what's going on with their consumer mindset. Because a lot of the data we look at has nothing to even do with an ad that we're running. It's like, let's take a look at what you guys think you need 
and who your audience is and then ask us, hey, we think this person likes this and this person likes this and we can look at all the contextual elements of our platform and it's no longer like a selling thing for us of, hey, this is what you ran with us, this is what performed, what didn't. It's you think your audience is this, this is what this person engages with contextually, this is what these person engage with contextually, let's build out what this looks like and it's, I don't know, curiosity is probably my favorite word so I'm glad you keep saying it. Like, <laughs> let's figure out the curiosity element of it and then you guys know your brand really well. We can tell you the things you're curious about and then figure out what that means. Now, Rachel, um, obviously you've got a connection to Grand Rapids, right? I do. Can, yeah. can you share that story? Because it's one of my favorites about this whole interview. Um, well, I came to Grand Rapids four years ago. This is what you're asking me, right? I am, yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's, um, I came to Grand Rapids four years ago um, as a budding travel blogger. Um, this was actually the first destination that I got that I got to work with, um, and it was paid. It was my first kind of like paid <laughs> gig to write an article about a destination. I was, you know, so green, but so ready to learn kind of, you know, what, what the chops are, and like what that looks like. Um, so I came here in the summer of 2018. Um, I wrote a story about summer in Grand Rapids with the um, uh, Grand Rapids Tourism Board, and it was kind of my first real foray into telling these types of stories through a content creator lens. So Grand Rapids holds kind of a special little place in my heart for, for that experience that it gave me. So that was kind of the springboard for my travel blogging career, which I do outside of Nativo. Explain how that might help you stay curious, right? Because I think one of the things about this space is in order to grow and understand how the modern consumer is traveling in the world, you, you have to be curious about the way in which you interact with with locales, and I would imagine you physically going and walking the streets and going to the stores and visiting, helps you then in your professional life to explain to another DMO, hey, not only does our platform do this, but I went here and did these things, so I know kind of what that looks and feels like. Yeah, if you asked me this four years ago, I wouldn't have been able to tell you because I've really had to take a step back and see how my like travel blogging life and my Nativo, you know, our, our pursuits at Nativo really work together but now I can kind of look at it and say what I love about the content creator side of me is that it grounds me in the storytelling you know we talk about the tech and the data and the numbers a lot right we have to sure um, but what I love about kind of the fact that I am going to these places and writing these stories is that it grounds me there I remember you know what the important elements are of that place I remember what really delighted me about you know Grand Rapids four years ago and those are the things that I remind myself of when we are digging through the data when we are pitching to a new destination you know yes we can talk about audiences and data and all of these good things but when I think about the storytelling side of it and marrying those two together and leading with that, I think that's what's made us so successful you know, in this category and in, in this space. These are places with so many stories, right? This is a unique vertical. We're not talking about, you know, let's say, I don't know, pharma or finance who desperately needs content but maybe doesn't <laughs> have it, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. This is a unique case for that. And by leading with the story, I think it's helped me appeal more to talking to these brands, getting a foot in the door, and then showing them the power of what that storytelling can do. So people are watching this podcast or listening to this podcast and they want to get involved because one of the struggles is, to your point, how they get that storytelling in front of the person at that moment that they need it. What's the easiest way for them to engage with you guys? Where do they find you? Um, well, they can reach out to us on Nativo. Yeah, currently at Esto or yes. yeah, find us at Nativo. <laughs> um, obviously, we're on LinkedIn and everything else. Awesome. Rachel, Michael, awesome. thanks for the time. Thank you. Thank cool. you.